Welcome back to another episode of the Game or Die podcast. I am your host, Ryan Moore. And I'm going to do a normal podcast this time. Uh, the last couple have been some music podcasts. I uh, interviewed my wife for uh, the Animal Crossing uh, episode. And so now I'm just going to talk about video games for a little bit. Like I always do, I'll throw in some music and stuff. But this is primarily just a normal episode. So. Right off the bat, what have I been playing? Well, my wife got me into Animal Crossing. That's one of the first things. Uh, I'm not a big Animal Crossing fan. I appreciate it. I just never played those games. I've never been drawn to them. I've never really played them for more than about five to ten minutes, which is not enough time to even get a grasp on what that game is. After hearing her talk, I tried to play the game myself with our uh, copy that we bought digitally. She bought it on her account. And so what I did is I uh, put her account on my Switch and then tried to play the game. Well, I couldn't play it on my account on my Switch, but I could play it on her account on my Switch. But it's a whole new uh, island and all that stuff, so I didn't really want to do that. Plus... We, only one of us could play it at a time. If I was playing on her account on my Switch and she wanted to play it, which she still is playing that game every day for most of the day, most of her free time is still playing that game. And it's, her island's really cool. So basically, if she wanted to play that game, I would have to drop the game. I would have to exit out of it and then she would go play. So we couldn't play together. We couldn't play it on our own Switches on our own accounts. So we bought another copy of the game. And then all these uh, articles online talking about how Animal Crossing has done better than it ever has before. And, um, you know, it sold millions and millions of copies. Yeah, because everyone has to buy it twice if they um, want to play. If a, a single other person wants to play that game other than the person who owns it, they have to buy their own copy. That's why it sold so much. It's ridiculous. Um, Nintendo, I should not get a pass anymore. Uh, I've been saying it for years. Their online infrastructure sucks. They suck at everything that they touch that has to deal with online. Their account systems and people just go, oh, ha, ha, in Nintendo, they're weird. Um, they don't know what they're doing. So whatever. And they get a pass every time. And I'm sick of it. Nintendo needs to step up. Stop buying their games if you don't agree with what they're doing. They need to get better. And the only way is if we stop buying their stuff. We already bought Animal Crossing and bought it twice, so it can't really do anything about that. And um, I've been playing it. I created my own island. I um, uh, got to the point where I'm kind of out of the tutorial now. I've built not just my house, but uh, three other houses on the island. I've got now new neighbors, not just the normal two. Um, I have Isabel in my town now, and I'm enjoying it. I'm having fun with it. It is something that I'm not taking super seriously. I try and play it a little bit every day, but there have been some times where I've just been so exhausted from work or, you know, I just kind of forgot sometimes where I haven't play, been playing it daily. But I is still playing it. I'm still enjoying it. It's just I'm not taking it super super hardcore seriously like I do with a lot of other games this is a game that I'm trying to relax with and when I'm relaxing I play it for 15 minutes maybe a day maybe 15 minutes every couple of days or whatever but I am enjoying it there is very little for me to do in it other than those like hey you pick up some you know shake some trees pick up some wood chop some trees uh, hit the rocks, gather all these things so that I can craft more stuff. And I craft more stuff. I find fossils. All that stuff is really fun for me. And I get something out of it. I get joy out of it. And it's very relaxing. It's a very cool down type of game after a, you know, a kind of hectic week or something like that or a hectic day. But it's not something that I'm going, oh, what's next? What's next? I'm just relaxing with it. And it's a game that I don't, that type of game doesn't exist for me a lot. Whenever I start a game, I pick it up and I play it and I try to complete it and finish it. And once it's finished, I very rarely ever look back. So 
this is a really fun game for me, but it's very limited in its scope for me right now. And I want more things to do. And I know I can. My wife keeps telling me and keeps hounding me about it. She keeps going, you need to do this. You need to do that. And I'm like, you know, just chill. It's cool. It's cool, my babies. I, I like just going at my own pace with this game, even if it's going to take me like a year to get where she is only um, about two months after the game's been out. That's okay for me. I'm, I'm not really looking for anything in particular more than just playing the game, relaxing, having some fun, picking up some stuff I find on the ground, crafting a couple things, going about my day, and then turning it off. I really like it. I'm having a lot of fun. So I've been playing that on and off for the last several weeks here. But a game came out that I've been looking forward to for oh, let's just call it about 25 years. <laughs> uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about Streets of Rage 4. Streets of Rage 4 is a game that I've wanted since Streets of Rage 3 came out. And not after I played and beat Streets of Rage 3, because I didn't do that until about a year and a half ago. Uh, last summer, not last summer, the summer before last, uh, we moved into our new house. and. One of the games that I first started playing in this new house was the Streets of Rage series. And the reason why is because Streets of Rage 4 was announced. And I was like, oh, I'm so excited for this stupid game. And it took all this time for it to get announced and then finally come out. And it came out a couple of weeks ago. And I was so hyped. I'm sure I've talked about Streets of Rage at least a little bit on this podcast, but if I haven't, because I don't listen to, you know, the podcasts, I just make them and put them out and hopefully people listen. If I haven't talked about Streets of Rage, it's one of my favorite brawler series of all. I think it is the best brawler series of all time. The music goes a long way with that. It's the music is intertwined into the DNA of that game series. Yuzo Koshiro is phenomenal uh, with his soundtracks in the first two Streets of Rage games. There was a third one that came out, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But basically, my history with the Streets of Rage series is when I got a Sega Genesis in 92, 93, somewhere around there, uh, my parents my parents didn't buy it. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But my aunt and uncle, um, when they were, you know, when, when I was a lot younger, my aunt and uncle came over to our house one day. And they were just talking, just hanging out with my parents and stuff like that. And I was a little kid back then. You know, I was like seven or eight, maybe. It was right after my sister was born. And she was getting all the attention. You know, she's the new baby and stuff. and so. I was feeling a little left out. And so my aunt and uncle sat down next to me and they were just talking with me. Hey, Ryan, how's it going? What are you doing? You know, what are your interests? You know, just uncle and aunt type stuff. So they asked me, hey, uh, is there anything you really, really want for Christmas? And this is like the middle of July. So Christmas was pretty far away still. And I was thinking about it and I said, oh, yeah, the Sega Genesis Sonic 2 just came out. and um, Whenever I would go over to my grandma's house, uh, she had a neighbor who had um, a very young kid, uh, a grandkid my age. I think it was maybe about a year or two older, but roughly around my age. And he had a Sega Genesis. And that was, I would go over to my grandma's house and, you know, play in the pool and all this stuff. But I'd always go over to my friend's house and play Sega Genesis. Uh, he showed me not just Sonic 1. But he played games like Pit Fighter and uh, Splatterhouse 2 and 3, games like that. And so I saw a lot of weird crap that I probably shouldn't have as a very young kid uh, from that friend. I don't remember his name, but man, he was a cool dude. And he had a really, uh, he had an older brother that was just into all that, you know, 80s, early 90s, you know, horror movie stuff. He had the Freddy Krueger claw glove. Uh, he had the Jason mask and stuff. And so we would uh, secretly watch some of these old horror movie VHSs at his house. And I totally forgot about that until just now. But 
I wanted a Sega Genesis so bad, but we did not have the money for it. My parents just could not afford one to just give me. So my aunt and uncle said, hey, what do you want? And I said, oh, Sega Genesis Sonic 2 is just coming out. It's got packing game and blah, 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 blah. You know, as, as kids just go off on a subject and you're sitting there as an adult going, oh boy, I opened up a can of worms. <laughs> so my aunt and uncle said, all right, cool. Well, you know, and they left and uh, just, I, I didn't think about it, you know, for, you know, however long it was. I believe it wasn't the same day, but they came back over to our house fairly recently after uh, that encounter. And they were, you know, talking with my parents, uh, hanging out with my sister, you know, the new baby and all that again. And then I'm sitting there just playing my Nintendo. And my aunt says, hey, Ryan, come over here. And there was this big box in the middle of uh, the hallway. It's a big present in the middle of the hallway, all wrapped up. And they said, what do you think that is? And I go, I don't know. I, I thought it was a present for my sister or something like that. And I'm like, why is a baby getting a big box present or whatever? And they go, no, it's for you. And I'm like, wait, what? And so I rip it open. And sure enough, Sega Genesis with the pack-in Sonic 2 game. I'm, you know, yelling and screaming like a crazy person, just going, oh my gosh, I cannot believe it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And hooked it up to the TV and just nonstop played it. I had a Nintendo. I had a Super Nintendo. I had a Sega Genesis. So I have no um, stake in a console war. I thought console wars were pretty stupid for the most part. And I do think that still, but I will side on what system had more power? What system had better games? I don't care about the hardware itself. More so, I care about how the game runs. If it is a, um, a multi-platform game, which system does it run better on? If it runs better on the Super Nintendo than the Sega Genesis, I like the Super Nintendo version of that game. If I have a multi-platform game that only plays uh, or, or plays better on the Genesis versus the Super Nintendo, I like the Genesis version. If there's a game that is not on one of those platforms, I like that game. I don't care about the system as much, and I've always been that way. I would delve deep in, into these console war discussions, and I say, uh, who cares? <laughs> and I still feel that way. Console wars are dumb for the most part. You can have fun discussions talking about that stuff but when you take it really seriously you gotta go you gotta take a step back because let me talk for a second here when you realize that the hardware of consoles console hardware is always holding back everything anyways then your best option to play the game is always on pc except for the few um weird outliers like um Batman Arkham Knight, you know, that mess of a port or something like that. But even then, as technology progresses, the Arkham Knight port is not an issue on the PC anymore because of the hardware. You can brute force 4K60 on modern har PC hardware. That game came out in 2015. Five years later, the game runs solid. And it ran solid back then if you had good enough hardware. I had a 10. 80 Ti, I believe, at the time. I could be wrong on that. It might have been a 970 or a 980 Ti. And it ran fine. It was okay. It wasn't the best. There was some stutters, but it was still just as good as the PC, uh, PS4 or the Xbox port because you're still running at a higher frame rate anyways. So console, console war stuff, I don't really care. I just care about the game. Where does it play best at? I read an article today about Witcher 3. And Witcher 3 is, again, that game came out in 2015 as well. It's the fifth year anniversary today of uh, The Witcher 3. And everyone's talking about the Switch port, which is the legitimate, no, no strings attached, it is the worst version of that game that you can play it is downgraded to all heck and back it is on the most inferior subpar hardware now does that mean that game is bad or that system's bad 
No, it just means it's the worst way to play it. And for someone who cares about video games at all, you should want to play the best version of any game. No matter what, having yourself tied to a single console is stupid. We're all adults. I, I, I'm assuming I have no idea how many listeners there are or uh, what your ages are, but I'm an adult. I'm 34 years old and I have enough money to buy a couple hundred dollar consoles and a really nice PC. If the PC port doesn't exist or if the PC port is crap, I'll buy it on whatever console has the best version of that game. Most of the time, the best version of those games are on the PC. It's fact. It's not an opinion at that point. But who cares? If you can afford it, big deal. Just play the, be- the, the version that you want. Have fun with it. Don't start flame wars on the internet because it's stupid. But when I get into arguments with my friends uh, about these consoles, especially like now the new consoles, you know, we're getting a little bit of information like almost on a weekly basis at this point of the PS5 and the uh, new Xbox. I'm not going to say Series X because (laughs) that's the dumbest name in the world. And again, it's not, uh, I'm not even going to get into it. But the new consoles, new hardware. We're getting a little bit of information each and every week almost. And my friends keep talking to me about it and they're just like hyping it up and hyping it up. And it's like, oh, no li- no loading times. So I'm like, that's not going to be actually true. We're still going to have loading times. But for those new consoles, because of all the SSD stuff and blah, 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 you know, uh, proprietary SSD hardware. Yeah, they're going to be significantly uh, decreased in loading times. But guess what? We've had that forever on PC. That's not a big deal. I can load up any PC game. It always depends on the game. That's what I'm trying to tell people. It's not the hardware. It's the game itself. There are games that have zero loading times on PC. There are also games that have zero loading times on consoles. We already have that. It just really depends on the game. So if it's a big game, like let's say Spider-Man 4, because that's the only one we've even heard about. We haven't even seen real information about that yet. They just keep hyping it up and it's all marketing. Like, dude, if you really care that much, you're a marketing fool. Marketing people love you because you'll believe anything they say without proof. Wait for the proof to actually happen. Remember how when PS3 uh, announced that they were going to have no loading times? How'd that work out? Remember how when PS3 said, oh, we're going to have MP3 support? How'd that work out? Remember when the PS3 said they would have um, uh, save systems, uh, basically where you could hibernate your console and turn it back on immediately, get, get back into the game? How'd that work out? It didn't ex- that particular example didn't exist for I think what three ish years before it finally started actually becoming a reality, and even now today, some of it doesn't work because of online only games and blah blah blah. So it's not always foolproof. It doesn't always work exactly the way the marketers say it will. Because, dude, if you believe that, you're stupid. I'm sorry, but you are. So. Uh, I didn't mean to get on a tangent, but like I said, console wars are dumb. Hardware wars are dumb. Where is the best place to play the game that I want to play? If it's on PC, that's where I'm going to get it. If it's on Xbox or PS4 or PS5 or the Switch even, I'll get it there. There's only certain games for certain consoles. Console exclusive. That's why I own consoles for console exclusives. And that's pretty much it. And for the rare case when a certain version of a game is better than the other versions. That's it. So, ah, sorry, I didn't mean to go on a rant, but like I said, it's something that really bothers me when people get so hyped up about these marketing terms and marketing lies. Wait until the stuff is out, then start buying stuff if you want, 
And then if it doesn't work out, cool. If it does, don't brag about it because you didn't do anything anyways. You didn't create that console. You didn't create that hardware. You're just playing the game. Where's the best place to play it? Wherever the best version is. So bringing all that back to the Genesis and getting that from my aunt and uncle for no reason at all. They randomly bought me a Sega Genesis out of the blue. And I, I, that's always stuck with me. And when uh, I, have an, I have a nephew now, and so one of the first things that I wanted to do when, um, when I started uh, getting to know him was to do something like that. And it was just a cool memory. So I got the Sega Genesis and I played that thing nonstop. I got Streets of Rage 1. And I played that nonstop. Then I got Streets of Rage 2 and I played that nonstop. I remember sitting in my dad's office underneath his desk playing Streets of Rage 1. I took that thing everywhere because I loved that game so much. And so when Streets of Rage 3 came out nearly about 25 years ago, I remember playing it and I only played it once back then. I hated that game. I hated the music. I thought it was stupidly hard. And I couldn't even get past like the first level as a kid. And I just hated it. I rented it from Blockbuster. I returned it the same day. I think I might have maybe rented it another time, maybe a couple weeks later or something that like that. Or maybe my friend Andrew rented it. I cannot remember. But basically, we tried playing this game and I hated it. And I never knew why. And whenever Streets of Rage would come up in conversation, as I started getting older and in junior high and high school and college and all that, and even as uh, now an adult out of college and working, anytime Streets of Rage came up, it was always a conversation of one and two. It was never three. And then one day, I don't even remember how many years ago, this is probably about nine or 10 years ago, I remember hearing why Streets of Rage 3 sucked. And it made perfect sense. Streets of Rage 3 has two versions. The Japanese version and the English version. It actually has three. There's a PAL version or a European version in there. Uh, the Japanese version is only in Japanese. Uh, the USA version is, you know, in English. And I believe the European version is in English as well. It's translated. And this game is harder on the U.S. version than it is on the Japanese or European versions. And that's why that game sucks. Not the only reason, but the primary reason. It's extremely difficult. It's basically the reverse of uh, Super Mario Bros. 2. The original, real Super Mario Brothers 2, or if you're thinking about um, Super Mario Brothers 2 in the Japanese version, it's Super Mario Brothers USA, which is the lost levels here in America. Jap uh, Super Mario Brothers 2, or Doki Doki T Panic, is the reason why that exists, because it was so hard. And so, when you take that concept of, oh, the Japanese people, uh, the game makers think that this game is too hard, let's dumb it down or change it completely for the U.S. release. It's the exact opposite with Streets of Rage. The Japanese version is easier and the U.S. version is harder. And as a kid, I hated that game. And it makes sense. Go play the U.S. version of Streets of Rage 3 and you'll hate it. But if you go play the Streets of Rage 3 version, the Japanese version of that game, it's not that bad. It's okay. They've got some really cool stuff in it. And so what I did uh, la a couple of years ago when we moved into this house and during the summer um, of, what, 2018, I sat down and played through the series. I played through Streets of Rage 1. I played through Streets of Rage 2. And I found not just the Japanese version, but I found a patch to add in a bunch of stuff and patch the U.S. version to what is called Streets of Rage 3 DX, or Deluxe Edition. And it is a fan-made translation and patch that takes the Japanese stuff in the game and ports it to the U.S. version. It mods in 
different characters, different um, sprite schemes, uh, color schemes and things like that. Uh, the difficulty, music, levels, and it is the absolute best way to play Streets of Rage 3. Don't play normal cartridge version 1.0 of Streets of Rage 3 of the U.S. version. Play the patched version. Patch it yourself if you have to. Takes like five seconds anyways, and it is a much better experience. With that being said, the music still sucks. Oh, the music's so bad. It is ear bleeding bad. There are some okay tracks in it. Even one or two tracks that you're like, oh, this is pretty good. I like it. But most of it is just, oh, it's tinny. And it's not even like, oh, the Genesis sound hardware is bad. It's it's just awful noise. It's not music. It's noise. And so when Streets of Rage 4 was announced, I was excited. I was so hyped up for this game. And then I saw the the first trailer for it. And I'm not a big fan of game or movie trailers because they give away too much. Tell me when it's available. Let me download it day one and I'll play whatever it is as long as I already know what it is. If someone says, hey, Streets of Rage 4 is coming out later today, I don't need to watch a trailer. I'm just going to go play it. I'll buy it. I'm sure it's not that expensive anyways. What is it? 20 bucks? All right, cool. 25 bucks? Done. $40? Hmm. You know, I might wait until I see a, a review for it, but on its, on its head of a Streets of Rage 4 game, a numerical a sequel to the Streets of Rage franchise with the original characters, I'm down. No matter what, I don't need to see a trailer. But everyone was talking about it, and I just wanted to kind of see something, because if it's a normal sequel that comes out every year, a couple years or whatever, you know what it's going to be. But if it's a game that has or a, a numbered sequel in a series that hasn't been around for 25 years, you have no idea what that game's going to look like. So I looked at it and I went, hmm. It wasn't something that I immediately gravitated towards. It looked like a flash game almost. And I went, oh, I hope that's good. I didn't get down on it. I didn't get bummed out. I just hoped it was better than my expectations were. And over the years, uh, the last year and a half, basically, since it has been in development, you haven't really heard too much about it. So it finally came out. They announced, hey, we have a release date and it was a couple weeks later or whatever. Like, hey, the game's coming out in two weeks. And it's like, yes, just let me play. I don't need to see another trailer. I don't, I, I'm already... In, uh, so excited about it, especially since no games have come out this year, basically, that I'm chomping at the bit at everything that is coming out right now because there is zero games to play that aren't already out. A lot of games are just getting random updates that haven't been out for, that have been out for years and years and years. So I was excited and I downloaded it and I started it up and oh. It was like being a kid again. It really was. I'm not a big fan of nostalgia for nostalgia's sake, but that game really does a very good job of recreating the Streets of Rage series. It is different. It is new. It doesn't feel the exact same, and I don't want it to. We already have three games, and we have a crap ton of fan-made games over the last couple of decades. Man, I remember in 2000. Three, I was sitting in my garage room. I, I lived in the garage in junior or in high school. And uh, after I graduated and we were about to move, I had this room in a garage. And I remember sitting there modding Xboxes and transferring games over. And I remember the homebrew community came up with a game called Beats of Rage. And I remember downloading it and throwing it on my modded Xbox and playing it. And we have had games like that for years and years and years. I don't need a copy of Streets of Rage. I want something new. And so that's what this game does. It does something new. And it's phenomenal. I can't say enough good things about it. It is different. It is not the same. It doesn't have a better soundtrack than Streets of Rage 2. I'll get that out of the way right, right up front. 
it does not have a better soundtrack than Streets of Rage 2. And one of the things, the reason why that is, is because it's not just Yuzo Koshiro. He did this main theme, which I think is pretty good, but it's not something I'm just jazzed about. Uh, he did a couple other songs or tracks for the game, but he didn't do it completely. It is a combination of tons, uh, multiple, multiple artists. And when they let that out months ago, I was like, oh, that's kind of a bummer. But as I started playing through the game, I enjoyed it for what it was. And they do have an option to just throw it into a retro soundtrack mode where it's just the same songs you've heard a million times from those original games. But why would you do that? You know, you could just go listen to those any old time you want. I want something new. I want to play the game as it was intended to. So I tried it after uh, a couple playthroughs like that with the uh, retro soundtrack on. And I was just, I turned it off within, I think, like three levels. I was just like, eh, I've heard these songs. And it doesn't really match the style of the game as well. So I played it and played it and played it. And I played it through originally with Axel. You know, he's a big beefy guy. You know, he's weighty now. He's got a beard. It's 10 years after the, uh, the third game. And I enjoyed it, but I found it a little difficult with Axel. He's got the grand upper. He's got, you know, his other stuff, but it was just like, fine. I was like, ah, whatever, you know, Axel's fine. And then I uh, had some difficulty, and so I switched out characters. So I was like, well, I got to play all the characters, right? I bought this game, even though it's on Game Pass. Uh, I bought the game on Steam because I knew I wanted to support the developers. I wanted to make sure this game gets recognized. I just want to straight up own it. I don't want it on Game Pass, and I don't want it to go away someday if Microsoft feels like eh, it's no longer part of our Game Pass. But for people who are on the fence about it, holy crap, it's the best deal ever. Get a ton of these types of games for very little money. So if, if you're even on the fence, $15 is better than $25. Uh, $15, or uh, even if you've never had it before, they usually do a get Game Pass for the first month for $1. And so it's, it's a great deal. So I played through uh, with Axel for a little bit. I switched out to Blaze. Characters play very differently, and it adds to the fun of the game and variety to the game. I believe there is 12 levels altogether, and it takes about an hour and a half to two hours to get through the game. It's a pretty short game, but it's a brawler. All brawlers are pretty short for the most part. So getting through the game, single player, first time through with Axel and then Blaze. And then I switch to Floyd which is one of the new characters. There's two main new characters in this game, Floyd and Cherry. Floyd is the uh, apprentice of Dr. Zan, who was in the third game. He's like this robot guy. He's kind of like Dalsim, but with robot arms. And so I played with Floyd, but he's big like Max was in that game, in the original Streets of Rage. He's a massive dude who is super slow like molasses, but he's very, very powerful. And he's got some really cool moves. And then I played as Cherry, and Cherry unlocked the full potential of that game for me. She is the daughter of Adam, the original guy in Streets of Rage 1. And so she's this chick with a guitar on her back, and she is fast like Skate was in Streets of Rage 2 and 3. Just blazing fast. She runs, which no other character can do. She slides with her guitar. She has multiple guitar hits and stuff. A very good balance of speed and power. And she has really good combos too. And that's what, again, part of the reason why Streets of Rage 4 works better than Streets of Rage 2 or 3 does is because of the combo system. It allows you to rack up these massive combos with multiple, multiple thousands of points that will give you free lives. Uh, if you do well enough. And so you can get lives back. If you die a ton of times, you, you rack up huge combos. And also one of the things that I didn't notice right away, but once I did notice, it made the game so much better. With most brawlers, 
if someone's very close to the edge of the screen and you knock them off screen, they will go off screen and then you spend about a minute to two minutes playing this weird will they, won't they dance with them where you can't see them because they're off screen and you have no idea where they are. So they might be above you, they might be on top of you or below you, they might be in front of you. You might get attacked and you just have to wait there. And it's one of the most worst things about brawlers. So what did they do in four? They made it so that the edges of the screen are boundaries. And if you hit a person up in the air, because there's a bunch of juggling techniques, you hit a person up in the air, they will bounce and ricochet off the wall and then come falling back down. So you can continue juggling them and things like that. And it is one of the best minor little tweaks to the brawler formula that really opens up gameplay. It makes it much faster. And that's how you get through this game uh, in an hour and a half, two hours. Can you take a little bit longer? Yeah, but there's not really a whole lot. It's very linear and it's a small game. It has a good chunk of levels. It's got good boss fights. It's got some nostalgia. It's got some good enemy character types. It's got good combo systems. It is a good game. Is it a great game? Well, I think it might be. I might have to play it a couple more times. At this point, I've played through it about uh, almost three times. When I first started, first night through, I played it on medium just to get through the game. And then I played it through on easy. And then I played it through on hard. And I'm on right now the last level. And I just haven't gone back to it because I've been very busy with work. And so I haven't gotten to finish the game on hard. I've gotten through all the levels on hard, except for the last one. And the last one's kind of, huh, it's rough, especially on hard. And the reason why I've played through this game multiple times is because as you go through the game, you unlock new characters. And the new characters are really cool. They're sprite-based versions of the older games. So you have Streets of Rage 1, uh, Adam, Blaze, uh, and uh, Axel. Then you have Streets of Rage 2, Adam or Ac- Axel, Blaze, and Skate. Then you have Streets of Rage 3 with Dr. Zan, uh, Axel, Blaze, and Skate. And then there's a couple secret characters too. And there's some secret boss fights as well. This game has a lot for the small amount that it really is. I haven't played it uh, multiplayer though yet. And that's one of the best parts of Streets of Rage is, is it's a multiplayer game. So I'm looking forward to maybe someday playing multiplayer with someone if they want to. But I think it's a phenomenal game. It's on uh, Game Pass. So if you're on the fence about it at all, try it for like a buck, maybe 15 bucks. Or if you already just have that subscription, it's right there waiting for you right now. Go play it. Don't just take my word for it. Play it yourself and figure out if you like brawlers or not. But I think it really is a phenomenal brawler. I saw a lot of people bagging on the game as soon as it came out because they just said, oh, I played a couple levels and I hated it. I'm like, what character did you play? I just played as Axel. Well, yeah, no duh. You just played as a main boring character and you only played a couple levels. That game, just like with a lot of games nowadays, requires playthroughs. And I don't like that for the most part. You've heard me talk about how I only play games once, usually, and then move on. But this game is different. Just like Toe Jam and Earl back in the groove was last year for me. That was my favorite game of last year because it did something that I normally don't do. It made me want to replay it multiple times. And Streets of Rage 4 has done the same thing. It's small enough that you can. You're not wasting time. You're unlocking new characters. You're getting a feel for the level. You're getting a feel for how characters react. One time through really isn't enough. Normally, I would say the game should just be bigger then, but this is a small game. This is small indie developers and things like that. Uh, Dot Emu and uh, I cannot remember the other uh, uh, developers of this game, but they're smaller. They're not going to build out a 40 plus dollar game, but man, for 20 bucks, holy crap, it's worth it. I've gotten about seven hours of playtime out of the game already. Uh, I think I'm encroaching on eight. 
And it's so fun. I love it so much. So that was one of the games that I played. So with that, Streets of Rage 4, I'm going to um, pick out a song that when I played through this game the first time, I was like, ah, the music's okay. It's fine. It's pretty good. I'm enjoying this. But this song was when it really clicked with me. And I went, oh, <laughs> this is a really cool song. And the song itself is good. By itself is good. But with the gameplay, it makes everything so much more dramatic and so much more enjoyable. So without further ado, here's a song from Streets of Rage 4. And when I get back, I'll talk about some more games.
Okay, so next game that I've been playing. This one's cool. <laughs> I've been playing with my wife uh, this game a lot. And it's kind of become a almost nightly ritual. Again, the last few days have just been uh, pretty busy and hectic this crazy weekend. Um, so we didn't get to play it this weekend, but hoping to pick it back up tonight. A little game called Moving Out. And it is uh, in the same vein as the Overcooked series. If you've played Overcooked 1 or 2, you kind of have a familiar understanding of what this game is. Basically, instead of being chefs, like in Overcooked, where you are working cooperatively together to create meals and, and get them out into the uh, dining hall or whatever, wherever you are in the level, this game does a little something different. It's a co-op game, just like Overcooked, very similar controls, very similar art style, but you are a moving company. And so you are tasked in the levels are different houses or buildings that require you to move all the furniture or certain select pieces of furniture out. So you are not just grabbing everything. You are just grabbing certain things, um, a bed and a sofa and a TV and a refrigerator and a couch and um, a couple chairs and, and a table and a dresser but leaving everything else, like all the pictures on the wall or, or the mantle and, and stuff like that. Or if you're in an office building, you're, you're picking up, you know, printers and copiers and um, arcade cabinets and uh, uh, building stuff, you know, like in an office, but leaving certain other things like a desk or whatever. And this game is so much fun. It is, man, they need a new genre called husband and wife games, because that's exactly what these types of games are. They are the perfect, like, cherry on top gaming experience for husbands and wives. I don't know about you, uh, if you have a wife or a husband or not, uh, if you're listening or if you're too young to be married, but there is something really special about playing video games and doing co-op experiences with your spouse. It is just a really fun way to bond you know and it's one of the, it, i am so blessed to have a wife that loves video games um that was like one of the, the one things that i really wanted when i was uh online you know doing online dating and stuff like that i was like man do you, do you how do you feel about video games because there's a lot of people who think video games are very childish and yeah they can be but they can also be very fun. And, and gaming culture has seeped into normal everyday lives in a very different way than I thought it would. Um, talk to any grandmother or grandparent type person, and they've probably played video games at some point. They probably still do, whether that's poker or solitaire online. Um, there are uh, people like my sister who is not a big video game person. Uh, we played. Kingdom Hearts and uh, a couple other games. There was this one game that I'll, I'll just delve into this really quick because I want to talk about it because I every time I think about it, I get a big old smile on my face. When the Wii came out, there was a lot of shovelware with it. And uh, I'm not talking about Wii Sports, you know, that that's a game that everyone played, you know. But the one game my sister and I played together was this game called Trauma Team. And the reason why I think uh, she really liked it is because she's a nurse. And ever since she was a little, little, little kid, she always wanted to take care of people. And she was just the biggest weirdo about hospitals and, uh, you know, taking care of people and stuff like that. When she would play, uh, she wouldn't play house, she would play doctor. But it wasn't like kid doctor type stuff. It was like, you know what, I'm going to, um, wrap your arm in a cast and we're going to set it and we got to do all this stuff and blah, blah. Like, just think about like a, a TV show that has like a really cute child character who is very quirky and, and awkward. Um, and, and they're just one of those like saccharine type of characters that, that TV show executives like to create. That was kind of my sister. She had that type of personality. And so there was this game called Trauma Center where you are a doctor and it's like this weird atlas anime type version of it but she really really loved the whole like 
using the Wiimote to cut into a person and then peel away their skin and then, you know, go into their organs and find out what was wrong with them and then stitch them up and apply the medical uh, gel and the gauze. That's what the game is. And she loved it. So there's every once in a while a game comes out that I just no matter how weird it is or or how not in the mood I am to play video games, I just get a big old smile on my face for these types of games. And this game is a very good co-op game for, like I said, husbands and wives. It is a fun, enjoyable, don't take it too seriously type of thing that allows you to just bond with your spouse in a way that video games only can do. And so my wife and I have been playing this uh, on, on and off for the last couple of, uh, for about the last week or so. And we've been, we've been taking our time with it. And when we play these types of games like Overcooked, we try to get the best score. And so every level in o- Overcooked uh, has like a three-star rating. You do okay, you get a one-star. You do better, you get a two-star. If you do the best, you get a three-star. And we try to achieve not just the three-star, but go over that three-star ranking. You know, get a little bit more than what is required for three stars. So this game, Moving Out, is a little bit like that, where you have your characters, and they're all kind of goofy. You know, there's a a boy and a girl uh, character, and you can kind of change their clothes and hats and stuff like that. But then they also have, like, uh, things like octopuses and raccoons and uh, plant people and zombies and penguins. And they all got like these weird goofy hats and different clothing. You can also put them in a wheelchair <laughs> for whatever reason. I have no idea why both Overcooked and Moving Out both have wheelchairs as like the other mobility style of character. It's weird, but it's kind of fun. And it doesn't hinder your character at all. It's just purely aesthetic at that point. So I like it. Um, so this game, you're just a, a couple of movers and you got to move these things in and out. And what they do is it's, it's not on a star ranking system anymore. It is purely time based. And I'm not a big fan of time trials, but this isn't that bad. Basically what you do is you try to just complete the level. And that's all the only objective is just to complete the level within a certain time period. There is a bronze, silver, and gold time. You do it nice and good and quick and fast, you get the gold. If you do it a little bit slower, you miss a, it's not super tight, you get the silver. If you take way too long and you're super, super duper careful, you get the bronze. So that's that. But after you do it, the first time you, you complete the level, it unlocks hidden objectives, um, certain random things. It, it's always specific for the level itself. There's a level early on where you're in a chateau where there is snow on a hill, and you can use that snow to kind of throw uh, some of these uh, objects like couches or beds out the window and use the snow to just kind of slide the uh, object to right where the moving truck is. Now, one of the hidden objectives is to not use the snow. There's another one where it is use the snow. There's another one where it says, hey, don't use the stairs, but use the snow. So it's it's got these little hidden objectives. There's another couple levels where it's like, don't break any of the windows. And these are goofy, platforming, time trial-y co-op experiences. So you're encouraged to break stuff and throw stuff around. And the in-game explanation for that is, hey, uh, the people that we're moving for bought renters or uh, bought moving insurance. So who cares? So it's really fun to just throw stuff in. And the way you throw stuff, you can do it if it's a small item by yourself. But most of these items like couches and beds and refrigerators and stuff like that are too heavy for one person to move easily. So you got to get that other person. You got to co-op with that person and get some, you know, rhythm going. And then if you try and throw it, it won't work unless the other person is using the throw button and then pointing in the right direction as well. So, man, it is just a special, unique type of game that doesn't come along all that often. And it is so fun and so enjoyable. So 
if you're on um uh, or if you're in a relationship and you have someone who likes playing video games with you and you're trying to figure out hey man what do we do this is a really good game for that it's become our kind of nightly tradition play a level or two move on and it gets harder and harder and uh, there's some times where we're like oh we just i don't have the energy for this and there's unlockable levels too they have a arcade uh, game area and a VHS rental like blockbuster surrogate uh, area. And as you progress through these levels and you get golds and you get uh, unlock all the achievements or, or you do the hidden objectives as you complete the level, you unlock these little extra things. Some of them, most of them are pretty easy and pretty short, but they're just little extras here and there other than the main level. So if you get tired of the main levels, you can do those little extras to you know, as a good feeling end cap type thing. And what's really nice too is it is not frantic. You are not like beating the clock isn't that big of a deal. And what we do is we basically go through the level once and just try to complete the main objective in the fastest time possible. If we hit gold, cool, because then we've just knocked that out. But if we don't, we don't worry too much about it. Once you complete the level the first time, you'll knock those hidden objectives. And then you try and do it all in one go. That's, or that's what we try to do. You don't have to. You don't even have to complete the objectives. You just need to finish the main thing of moving these certain items. And those certain items are kind of shimmering or glowing a little bit. And so you know right away and the level kind of pans around at the beginning uh, to tell you, hey, this is where everything is. So we try it the first time. We unlock the hidden objectives. Uh, and then we try to do those hidden objectives. If we do all those hidden objectives in one or two or three runs, and these levels aren't that long, they're four or five minutes maybe at most, most of the time, and we didn't get the gold, then we try and get the gold. And we spend like maybe, what, 15, 20 minutes maybe doing this full level you know, a couple different times, and then we're done with it, and we don't ever have to go back to it, and we've unlocked everything that we could in that level. And so it is just a blast. I love that game so, so, so much that it's one of those games that I really, really do encourage a lot of people to at least try out as long as you have someone. Uh, it is definitely not a single-player experience. So that was uh, Streets of Rage 4 and Moving Out. <sighs> and then. Every once in a while, uh, especially last year, I've been trying to do this a little bit more and more, but I haven't gotten around to it as much. Um, last year, I played through the Castlevania series and a couple other series that I never got into as um, a kid or a young adult or whatever. You just Little blocks here and there of uh, gaming that I did not get to. Well, I did get to this first one. I picked up Prince of Persia Sands of Time, or The Sands of Time. And it's always been my go-to for a game that is just spectacular. The writing in it is very well done. The action is good. The puzzles are good. The, you know, um, the scenery and the level design is good. The mechanics of the game are good. Back in 2003, when this game came out, I could not shut up about this game. I remember my cousins and I, we went to um, we went to our cousin's ranch up in Northern California and they were playing the Xbox and I was just, sh I wouldn't shut up about Prince of Persia. And so I made my cousins play Prince of Persia since the time. And I loved it. I think everything about that game is phenomenal. It is Top tier, some of the best gaming of that time. Absolutely one of the games of the year uh, for me at that, at, in that year in 2003. So basically what they did is they took uh, Jordan Mechner's Prince of Persia from like the Commodore 64, the Amiga, DOS, Apple II, blah, blah, blah. And I've never really gotten into that game. I played it, you know, several times. I've tried to pick it up and play it, but... I get about five, ten minutes into it, and I just can't get into it. It is just such a weird game by today's standards that you really have to sit down and get in a mindset of, 
old school, old school gaming with very little graphics and the controls are very weighty and heavy. So what I do, or what I did, is I didn't play a lot of the original Prince of Persia games until this, until Ubisoft purchased the rights to create a new version of it and they did the Sands of Time. And it's a very similar story. Anyone who's uh, watched Aladdin knows like 90% of the story. Um, you are the Prince of Persia, uh, a.k.a. Aladdin in this case. You're not, not really Aladdin. I'm just saying he's very similar to that type of character. You play the Prince of Persia. You are on um, a mission to go see the Sultan of someplace. And in your travels, you come across this uh, th- this city and you ransack the city and take the, uh, um, the Maharaja's daughter. And you pillage the uh, treasury and you come across this really nice dagger. And this is all within the first cutscene within two minutes of story. I'm just kind of explaining what the story is. So you uh, take the princess, you take the uh, dagger, and you go to the sultan. And the salt or the, um, oh, I keep forgetting the stupid word. Wow, why am I blanking? Anyways, um, there's an evil advisor. Um, who looks and sounds and talks exactly like Jafar. Let's call him Jafar because that's pretty much who he is. So Jafar tries to uh, coerce you to use this dagger into this big hourglass that holds, quote unquote, the sands of time. So you use it and change everything in the world to uh, explode and and create all these, uh, turn all the people in the kingdom into these dead sand monsters. So. Your job is to get the dagger and, you know, put the sands of back, time back in this hourglass like Aladdin. You know, it's very similar to a lot of the story of Aladdin. Take away the genie. You got this story. So Sands of Time is a, a game where you are this prince and the prince is stupidly charming. He talks like this and, oh no, let me tell you a story about how I came to be. And he just talks in that really sweet sing-songy type of accent and cadence. And it's just really fun and it's enjoyable and it's sweet, especially at a time where everything was trying to be extremely ultra-violent and blah, blah, blah. This was a very nice just... Hey, it's it's just a pure type of gameplay uh, narration, and it's a narrated game. It's not heavily narrated. And one of the really cool little gimmicks or twists about this, and this is why I love this game and I wouldn't shut up about it back then, is that the narration or the prince, as he, you're playing through the game, it's he's telling a story to someone. And so when you pause the game and try to quit out, or if you die, he goes, oh, oh, if you die, he goes, wait, no, 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 no. That's not how it happened. This is what really happened. And you go back to the checkpoint before you died and you play the game again. If you try to quit out of the game, he goes, do you really wish to leave before I finish my story? Things like that. It is just, ah, oh, it's so good. It is something that I've never seen done in any other game ever. And it is so unique. And it's just a little thing. It's not a huge thing, but it's just a little thing that adds to the jo- enjoyment of that game. So you have this uh, girl character. Um, it's uh, the princess that you captured. Her name's Farah, And she, again, this is why this game is so good. It's because she tags along with you. You got the sidekick. And man, if you played any type of sidekick games ever, you know that sidekicks suck. They get attacked. They die randomly. You have to baby, basically babysit them more than anything else throughout the game. And she's with you literally almost the entire game. So you go, oh, no, I don't want to babysit this chick. But, dude, she's awesome. She helps you out. She uh, has a bow and an arrow, and she'll knock people out who are trying to attack you from the back, things like that. And so... She is one of the first examples in gaming where a sidekick doesn't suck. 
And you're just like, wow, they did something different and they did something better than everyone else at the time. And yeah, this was produced by Ubisoft, big company. But this, as far as I remember, no one talked about this game when it came out. So I, I don't know if it had a really big budget or if it had a big marketing push, but I had to beg and plead people to play this stupid game when it came out. So I've been playing it and I wanted to replay this game because I played it back in 2003 and I finished it and I loved it and I wouldn't shut up about it. But as the years have progressed since 2003, I've wanted to go back to it because I just had such a fun time. And I remember it not being that long of a game. And so a couple years ago, I went, oh, it's on GOG, G-O-G. Oh, it's on Steam. And I got those versions, and there was some weird stuff going on with the Steam version. I think they fixed it. Um, and the GOG version didn't have these issues where, uh, because it was on such an old PC platform back then, um, on Windows XP, it has some weird stuff with modern PCs. But it's very simple to, to correct, and there's mods now where you are able to crank up the resolution to ultra, ultra, ultra extreme. You can go up to 16 time, uh, 16K, basically, and downsample it to the native resolution of your monitor or projector or TV. And it looks amazing. And so that's exactly what I did. I took this game, I th or threw in a custom resolution, and had it down sample to 16K and playing it at 60 frames per second and 16K with a native 4, uh, 4K resolution on my projector. And then also doing, uh, what was it? Um, there's a post-processing filter on this game that makes it very look like a dream almost. Again, it's all told in technically a flashback anyway, so... It makes sense within the realm of the game and the universe and what, what's happening on screen. But I've always thought that post-processing filter looks like crap. And you can't disable it in the console versions. You can disable it on the PC. It's very simple and very easy. You disable it and it looks amazing. I did a review of it. I wrote it up. And, uh, wrote a review for this game because I've always wanted to talk about it in detail. And so I did that, and I used a, uh, uh, a screenshot for the review on the website GamerDie.net, and it has that resolution, and in, in, just look at it. Just look at the screenshot, and you go, man, that looks great. Yes, yes, it does. So Prince of Persia, whoo, sands of time, man. And so I was talking about it earlier. I said, it's a series. So when the sequel came out, Prince of Persia, Warrior Within, Ubisoft tweaked the formula of this game, and it pissed a lot of people off. Immediately, as soon as you grab the controller, you can tell it's a very, very, very different feeling to that game. Same type of gameplay, same type of, you know, same character and all this, but... The attitude of the prince is changed dramatically. He's like a different character almost. It feels that way. He's not, but it feels that way. And they went hardcore into the angsty teen uh, demographic with this game. So the prince is, you know, like black hair and, you know, just angry and pissed off. And you got um, a lot more blood and uh, sexy ladies wearing basically nothing type stuff, you know, as enemies. And um, you got a lot more vocal performance from the enemies. And then you also have these uh, music, uh, grungy, hard new metal rock guitar riffs that play instead of something more like uh, the original Prince of Persia game where it uh, had a lot of sitar music and uh, you, you felt like you were in the Arabian area. <laughs> and so it's just, it's a weird tonal dissonance from what the original or the, that Sansa time game was. It 
it just doesn't fit. But at the same time, because of the aesthetics of the game, uh, because of the way the game looks and feels, it does feel very like, oh, I'm angry and I want to kill people type of, you know, vibe to it. So I guess it kind of works for that, but it kind of sullies the good intentions that the first game did. And it just, it feels like it has a marketing push and uh, uh, built by a lot of focus groups where it was like, well, this one was too saccharine. This one was too cheesy and lame. So let's take it to the hardcore extreme and appeal to the angsty teenagers of the day that are the demographic for the Xbox. And it, it just, it's kind of a bummer. And so I started playing it. And why I'm so excited about this game that I keep saying is uh, just kind of a weird tonal difference than the original game is because when I played this game back in, I believe it was 2005 when it came out on the original Xbox before the 360 came out, I really, really, really wanted to finish it, but I got so hung up on the way the game is made. There is basically like you didn't it was a very linear game in the first part. You go from point A to point B and you don't backtrack. There's no repeated areas or levels. And that's what this game is. All repeated areas. You play about 25 percent of the game and the rest is backtracking through multiple different areas in different versions of the present time and uh, olden time. You, you use the sands of time basically or a rewind capability to um, travel back and forth through time and you're using you're in the same areas over and over and over again it was just like when I was playing it I was so pissed off and you also turn into this dark prince version that you know the sand monster type of version of the prince that uh, has a lot of different move sets and things which kind of can be cool and I haven't gotten to that yet in my playthrough but I remember it back then and you're, from what I remember, and I can be wrong on this, but this is over 15 years ago when I played it. <laughs> uh, I remember when you turn into the Sand Monster Prince, you have different abilities and your life drains. And I got stuck on this one part where I was trying to rush to the area so that I can regain life. And I was so far away from it that my life would drain before I got to that point where I can regain life. And I just was in this immediate full-on infinite death loop with that game. And I was pretty far along. I'd say probably about 60 to 75% of the way through that game. From what I remember, I could be wrong. But it felt like I, I completed a good chunk of that game. And since I was in this death loop, I had to you know go back to a previous save point. Unfortunately, I didn't have one. And so I kind of screwed myself over on that and I dropped the game because I didn't want to replay the entire game to just get back up to that point. I remember because it was on a modded Xbox that I tried using like trainers and things like that to um, or, or downloaded game saves. But for whatever reason, I just couldn't or didn't. And then I was so discouraged from playing that game that I haven't picked it up since then until a couple days ago. and. I'm really, really excited to get through that game and then move on to the third game in the series, which is uh, the Prince of Persia Two Thrones. Um, very Lord of the Ringsy style of <laughs> treatment, which that's the third game as well. So uh, whenever I talk about Prince of Persia and, and Lord of the Rings, I kind of get them mixed up every once in a while. The Two Thrones is... Uh, is uh, the third game in the series, not the second game like The Two Thrones is. Or I, Again, I, I might be mixing this stuff up. It's been a long day. I've been talking for about eight hours almost um, through this podcast and also work and stuff like that. But I'm really excited about this third game to get to because I heard that it's much better. They kind of improved everything. They they walked back a lot of the characteristics of the prince. They added some really good new mechanics. But I am enjoying so far the Warrior Within again because I remember how much I loved the combat. That was the one like saving grace of the second game is the combat has been 
so much more unique and better and just uh, just so much more amazing than the first one. The first one has some good combat and I never had a problem. It was one of those things that I remember always hearing whenever someone would bring up the series. Prince of Persia 1 combat sucks. Prince of Persia 2 combat is pretty good. Prince of Persia combat 3 is amazing. And so I remember loving Prince of Persia Warrior Within, the second game's combat, and it being amazing and really good because that's all I played uh, just the first two games. But I never had an issue with Prince of Persia Sands of Time combat until I played it this last week. Um, I had a really difficult time with some of the combat scenarios. I played, I believe I played it on hard. I can't remember. I started the game about two years ago, uh, but I was only about 45 minutes in, and then I picked it up again uh, this week and finished it. And the game's not very long. It can You can get through that in about a sitting or two, depending on how long you like to play video games for. It took me a little over six hours, or like five and a half hours, six hours to complete, and I haven't played through it since it originally came out in 2003. So I didn't remember any of the... Um, the puzzles or the landscapes or anything like that, just kind of going through at my own pace on hard, and I beat it fairly quickly. So you can do it too. I did have some real issues with some of the combat, and it wasn't even the combat itself. The combat's fine. It's kind of basic. It's very basic, actually. But I hate when enemies block and just block and block and block and block, and there's a couple enemies, especially at the end of the game, where you literally are hitting them for like 30 seconds straight and they are just blocking, 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 blocking. And they do the Ubisoft thing of, for the most part, a ton of guys and they don't really try and hit you if you are engaged with another enemy. But when when enemies are blocking you, you're not engaged with them. And so you can get double or triple teamed a lot of the time in the end of the game just by that weird, you know, blocking mechanic that just doesn't do damage. It doesn't chip away at uh, life or anything like that. And you are more uh, caught off guard than they are by just blocking. So Warrior Within's combat changes it all up. There's multiple different ways to take down enemies. You can grab, you have double wielding capabilities as well. You don't just have the sword. You have another one that you can pick up. All or most enemies have a weapon that they will drop. So there is damage degradation to weapons as well. Weapon durability for your secondary weapon. And it's it's just so much more full of a game from a mechanics and system standpoint that it's really refreshing compared to the last game. But the tone does bring it down a lot. And so... I'm really excited to finally say I finished Warrior Within because I've never done it before. I dropped it back in 2005 and never picked it up until to, or a couple days ago. And so I'm going to go try and finish it either tonight or tomorrow and, and hopefully get to the next game, the third game, and then go to the, you know, the rebooted 2008, just Prince of Persia version, which I played through most of it. I don't think I finished that game either. Um, but I did not take to that game as much as other people. A lot of people like that game, and I don't know why. Um, well, I know why. I don't think it's a bad game. I just don't think it's a very interesting game for more than a couple hours. The fact that you can't die, there's no um, risk to uh, trying something. There's no risk-reward. There's no death um, in that game makes it really hard to enjoy. It's very bubbly and very just whimsical, which is fine, but that's not what I was wanting from a high definition three uh, um, Xbox 360 version of Prince of Persia that I was waiting for. So I'm really excited about this um, and this warrior within kind of finishing it up and getting into the new game. And just give me my thoughts on that. But like I said, I haven't played through it. I, I'm about an hour-ish, maybe an hour and a half into Warrior Within. So there's still a lot of stuff to unlock, a lot of stuff to go through. I'm not even to the part where you change into the other uh, part of the prince. So I've got a lot of stuff to get through. 
but I'm having fun, man. I'm I'm really enjoying games right now, um, especially when there's nothing coming out. I'm going back to some older games and I'm just having a blast. So I always encourage, I, I like to try and encourage people, especially if since nothing is coming out, go into your backlog and try some games. There are still new games coming out. They're just a lot more rare right now. Try Streets of Rage if you like, even remotely like brawlers. I think this is a really good new brawler. It's not my favorite. I, I don't think it ever will be, but I think it's up there. I think it's talking uh, like in, in the conversation of good brawlers. Um, if you want a co-op experience, moving out is fantastic. Oh, moving out is so good with another person. If you don't have those games or don't have Game Pass, I think moving, moving out and Streets of Rage 2 are both on Game Pass. So if you even want to try them out, not a big barrier to entry. And then what I would suggest is if you don't like those games, can't think of anything else new coming out that you want to get into, try some old games, go into your backlog, look at something or a series. That's what I really like about this podcast is it's been getting me into series. I think about, hey, what could I play to talk about on the game, uh, the podcast? It allows you even though like i know not a lot of people are listening to this and i'm just doing it for more for myself and to be able to just have an outlet to talk about games but oh man it's such a joy when i play a game when i go through like my launch box or whatever and i have thousands and thousands of games to go through and i have them all at my fingertips and i go man I would like to try that game. I remember hearing about that game or I, I've always wanted to try this, but I never have. And I just load it up and start playing it and then I get sucked in. And then it's a series, so there's a multiple games to play. And so if it's a very easy to game, a very easy game to get through, I can just get into the next one and the next one and the next one. I've been wanting to play a lot of Tony Hawk again for whatever stupid reason. And then a couple of weeks ago or uh, last week, they announced um, the remaster, which I'll probably talk about this in September when it actually comes out again, and I'm going to try and not go on a rant. Everyone's freaking out like this is the first time they've ever remade Tony Hawk. Um, they remade Tony Hawk 1 in the Xbox version in 2002 or 2003 with Tony Hawk 2X on the Xbox. Uh, they remade Tony Hawk in 2012 on the 360 with uh, and the PC with Tony Hawk HD which is both of those games combined one and two and it's in HD and it had DLC that added uh, levels from 3 in there so this is not the first time that they've remade this Tony first two Tony Hawk games however it hopefully is a much better than HD i didn't think HD had a really uh, it wasn't that bad of a game. A lot of people hate it. Yes, the physics are off. Yes, it's a little bit different. It's not the exact same, but it's totally fine. And especially when they did the, the revert pack with the DLC with uh, adding in reverts and, and levels from three, it's perfectly okay to play, but it's no longer available because of licensing issues. So them announcing this new version, I'm all for it's kind of more expensive than I want it to be. It's $40 and uh, it's Epic exclusive right now on the PC. So Epic Game Store, but Epic has a thing right now, the sale, and they are doing these $10 coupons. You get a $10 off coupon for any game that's $15 or more. And so what I did is uh, a couple days ago, I went and bought um, Before We Leave which is like some sim city type of building, you know, um, type of game. And I haven't gotten a good grasp on that yet, so I didn't want to really talk about it. But I'm, I've been playing that and I bought that for, uh, it was $20, I believe, or 30, 20 or 30, I think it was $20. So I bought it for five bucks because I got $10 off. Uh, no, so I, sorry. I bought it for $10 because it was $20 originally and a $10 coupon. I need to get back into basic math. <laughs> so 
I did that. And then every time you buy a game with those coupons in during the sale, you get another $10 coupon. So I have a $10 coupon. Uh, I could pre-order Tony Hawk H or a remake one and two uh, right now on Epic for $30. And that's a little bit easier to swallow. Will I buy that game? Yes. Will I buy it day one? Probably. Um, will I enjoy playing it? Absolutely. Especially because they're adding in uh, the skaters like Tony Hawk, Chad Muska, Rodney Mullen. Um, I think Rodney Mullen. He's in the second game, right? Yeah, he's in the second game. So they're adding all in all the uh, original skaters, but modern versions of them. So they're older, you know, they, but it's all high def. And so I'm, I'm down with this game. I'm excited, but I want to go back and play some of those older games too, because they're stupidly easy to play. Uh, just pick up and play them, go through them for an hour or two. You beat the game and you don't have to even go through every single character to just have some fun with it. So I got really excited when that game got announced for the fact that it comes out in early September, which is around my birthday. September 10th is my birthday. It comes out on September 4th on Tony Hawk's birthday, apparently. So um, I'm really, really excited for that game just as a video game birthday present to me. There's so many times that games don't come out that I want them to come out around my birthday and it doesn't happen. And every once in a while, when a game does come out on my birthday or around my birthday, it's something really special to me. And so I just buy it for myself. I play it all night long and I just have a blast. And hey, it's my birthday. <sighs> I love video games. Video games are rad. I hate when people talk down about video games or act like video games aren't super cool. Even when it's being uh, fake, even when they are joking around. When you hear someone say video games are stupid, I just I, I shut my brain off to that person because video games are rad. They're super fun. So go out and play some video games, man. It is so fun to just get into these stories and these worlds, whatever they may be. If you're not liking a game, don't feel like you have to complete it. Don't try and force yourself to love a game if you don't. There's so many times that I do that and I have to take my own advice. I hate play through games every once in a while and I go, why am I doing this? I'm not having fun. Go play some games that are fun that you enjoy, whether that's a game you've played for a million times or you've never touched before. Go play some games. All right. So I've been talking for about two days straight. I'm exhausted. It's really hot in this room, <laughs> this audio booth. So um, I'm going to go and go play some games. I'm going to take my own advice. Thank you very much for listening to the Game or Die podcast. I've been your host, Ryan Moore. And if you want to follow some of the stuff that I've been uh, playing or want to read some reviews on even movies, uh, I do some, I just do reviews of things that I think are interesting that I want to talk about. And that is on my website, gameordie.net. Very simple, very easy. You can find it. And I throw up the podcast on there. I do a couple uh, game reviews. I've done some articles. I haven't really done a lot, but um, I've watched a couple movies that I just really wanted to talk about as well. So that's there too for you. Thank you very much for listening and I'll catch you next time.